thank you for having me here. So as you, can, as you could probably see, if you were monitoring the website for a while, you could see Joachim Kunkel keynote, no title. And the reason is that I spent a long time thinking about what to talk about. There is a number of interesting trends. But as I was doing this, and this was really month, um, we were doing a lot of 20 nanometer development and learning more and more and more about that. And um, the longer it took and the more I was procrastinating, the more interesting I thought it would be to talk to this audience about what's going on after 28. And I'm going to try to give you a little bit of a flavor as to what our insights have been so far. So uh, number one, I mean, this is a, a very self-serving picture of a system on a chip that just serves the purposes of the business that I'm running. So we're all about uh, creating a bunch of IP building blocks that hopefully our customers can then connect using some sort of standard interconnect on the chip. And by standard interconnect, I don't really mean the fabric itself. The thing that's important is that where these building blocks connect to the fabric that we agree on some sort of standard on the port, basically. And I think in this case, uh, AMBA has served us very, very well for a long time. And I hope that it will continue to serve us very well for a long time. Because once that breaks down, SOC in the, in the way of assembling chips from building blocks will go away. So um, that's the first thing. The other, the other element that we have in terms of perspective is that these um, chips have just become a hardware execution engine for software. So there's a tremendous amount of software running on that. And because of this, of course, in my business unit, we spent some time thinking about what are other things that we could do, how can we help our customers to develop all the software faster, how can we help them with the integration of the hardware and the software, and how can we help them with the system validation, and actually the area that we have been building a business in is the area of prototyping, both in the virtual form as well as in the hardware-based form. But um, why am I talking about this? Well, the reason I'm talking about this is that one of the trends in IP that many of us have been talking about already is IP subsystems. And in the end, an IP subsystem is just an SOC in the small. So what's happened on the chip, we went from hardware only, pretty much no software, to something that when you apply a reset to and there's nothing in the memory, nothing will happen. So an SOC is hardware and software. That's the way that the functionality is defined. You take something that was an SOC two, three generations ago, and today that's become a subsystem. And one example, which is the first one that we've done at Synopsys, was just where we took uh, some audio processors. This is a dual ARC uh, processor. All of the audio uh, digital uh, componentry that you need, added all of the analog um, codec componentry to that, threw in hundreds of thousands of lines of codecs implemented in software for Dolby and DTS and all of these wonderful things and deliver a drop-in subsystem for audio functionality. Now, obviously, those who make audio chips just for audio are not going to be buying this, but somebody who's doing an SOC who just needs a certain type of performance for an area for a cost is definitely contemplating using these things. Now, let's look at what's really driving a, a big part of the IP business is actually the, progress, uh, the progression of the semiconductor technology. And what we've plotted here is um, basically the different ways of adoption of the process nodes. In purple on the left-hand side, you can see the 90 nanometer node. And uh, the, um, the pale purple, so this portion here, is the number of cumulative designs. So we started out in 2003, Q3, right? And you can see that around um, Q1 of 04, there had been about 50-something uh, chips that had been taped out in 90 nanometers. And the dark purple represents all of those chips that were in development in those days. So in Q4 of 2004, there were about 150 chips cumulatively that, had, that were in development, from which about 50-something, 60 had been taped out. Okay, And we track this. We have some pretty good insight into what's happening because of our tools business. And if some of you are now starting to get a little bit worried about your design data, there's only one person in the whole company who knows the names and the companies associated with every chip. And that's Deidre Hanford, who is in charge of all the um, support activities in the company. Everybody else only sees the statistics. So your information and your know-how is very safe, although we can all start guessing a little bit as to what these active 1614 and the active 989 9 nanometer designs are. Um, but basically, so we moved forward here, and then you can see at some point in red, you can see the 28 note. And up to the 28 note, things were pretty consistent. We started doing our development for USB 2.05 in 28 node in um, Q1 of 2009. Taped it out about six, seven months later than that, etc., etc. 
Life was difficult, but life was still very reasonable, at least for our engineers. And proof of that is that in the course of uh, the time that followed, we have been um, developing a lot of IP for the 28 nanometer node. There is about 30 test chips that we have taped out ourselves at Synopsys with 28 nanometer IP on it, um, which we do routinely, and a whole slew of, uh, of titles on that, DDR and USB and PCI Express, etc., etc., and analog IP, and now, of course, also embedded memories and standard cells, etc., etc., etc. Great, and a lot of customers who used that, and okay. Um, and what happened then? Well, and what then happened is that the world kind of changed. The, uh, the difference between doing analog design and the 20 nanometer process from doing it in 28 is uh, very, very significant. Um, and basically what's happened is that the, uh, the design rules for manufacturability have increased tremendously. In particular, they have become extremely restrictive. If you're doing analog design, one of the things that you do is you just play with device sizes. One of the typical approaches is you have some architecture slash layout that kind of works. And from node to node, you just resize your devices a little bit, but kind of stuff stays roughly where it is, and stuff works. Um, the set of devices that are available in 20 is much smaller. Uh, of course, they're nastier. But in particular, you cannot just scale your devices. That is over. They come in a quantized manner. Those are the only ones that you're allowed to work with. Now, for a digital designer, you go like, well, so what, right? I'm used to that. I have a library, and what's in there is in there. For an analog designer, this is a disaster. An analog designer loves to tweak the devices, ideally also formally the process that comes with the device, in order to get something done. This is no longer doable. So that changed. Um, and the solution to this is basically you need to come up with different circuit architectures. That's the only thing you can do. Okay, the other thing that's uh, extremely important is that, um, and this alludes a little bit to the uh, things that Martin was talking about in reuse. In particular, when we're working with the early adopters of our IP, the uh, manufacturing rules are starting to um, tell you in general what's the orientation of that IP, what can you do, what can you not do, et cetera, et cetera. And in the case of FIs or hard macros, that starts putting significant restrictions on uh, what the layout for the SOC can look like that your customer's building. So there's a couple of ways around that. The first one is to work very, very closely with your customer in order to decide, for instance, whether the DDR is going to be on the left side or it's going to be on the top or it's going to be on the bottom or it's going to be on the right or whether you want it to wrap around the corner uh, because many times you don't just have one but you have two and you need many, many pins for these things as we all know. Um, you can do this through working with customers directly and having a lot of discussions. You can be a little bit more intelligent, and what you do in your factory is that you create your own automation so that when the customer says, hey, around the corner, 32 pins on one side and then another N on the other side, you just enter that and you have some sort of file compiler or something that does that automatically for you. And then you leverage, of course, your infrastructure in order to be able to deliver that uh, correctly. But uh, it's extremely important that these things get discussed with customers early on. It's no longer that you can just pick some IP based on power, performance, and area, and it'll fit into the layout. It's important that you consider the physical attributes of the IP and that the uh, design teams take this into account from the very, very beginning. And I'll talk a little bit more about what's happening there. Um, of course, uh, another interesting thing are the system specs. The system specs is everything is faster all the time. It's got to be smaller, consume less power because it's being op battery operated. All of this is completely wrong uh, relative to what's happening in semiconductors. But basically, the system guys or the guys who write the system specs couldn't care less about what we're doing in semiconductors and what's happening on the process technology side. The speed of the interfaces continues to increase while actually our thick oxides are going down the toilet. Uh, nobody cares. It's like, look, I mean, come on, deal with it. I was talking to a design manager recently. He said, oh, look, I, in the end, nobody cares, so I don't care about your problem. You just deliver an IP that's able to do that. Nobody cares about whether it's difficult or it's impossible. It's just got to work. Figure it out. Okay, another aspect has been the one of reliability, in particular also. And um, in the meantime, uh, reliability simulations are an absolute must not just simulations, but also trying to identify what actually the reliability and the aging is going to be of those devices. 
uh, models for aging don't really exist early on in the design process, but at the same time, you need to design these things early on because somebody will be the first one to tape out with it. I already talked about the bad core devices. Um, they're getting worse and worse and worse. The headroom that you have is becoming minimal, and they leak, which means they consume power. All the things that we don't want. Last but not least, everything has to continue scaling. Uh, you had a USB 3 a year ago or two years ago, and everybody says, like, yeah, I understand that you're going to a smaller note, and that this is more difficult, and that analog stuff does not scale and get smaller. Well, it's not my problem. Right? For that analog IP to still make it onto the chip, it also has got to shrink somehow. And obviously, you're not going to be able to shrink analog just by making the devices or something like or the layout smaller. You have to come up with a different architecture that will allow you to do that. The trick to pretty much everything is take a step back and redesign the architecture of pretty much every analog mix signal IP building block that you have on the chips in 20. And uh, I'm talking about 20 Planner at this point in time. Uh, we are all getting involved in the adventure of FinFET. And obviously, nothing is going to remain the same going from Planner to FinFET. The only thing that remains is that at least we know how to handle double patterning. That's something. Okay, so let me give you some examples. You get the design manual, and then uh, this design manual has a lot of three-letter acronyms and a few that are a little bit longer. And basically, these are the processing requirements. And you go like, mm-hmm, sounds good. So this is what your semiconductor vendor or your foundry believes the process is going to look like. And uh, what we decided to do for 20 very, very early on was to just resort to the typical things that you do as a physicist, which is you do an experiment. An experiment, in the case of semiconductors, is called a test chip. So we just decided to do very, very early on a test chip, and try to figure out what are really the implications of all of these effects here on analog mixed signal design. So what does this thing look like? This is basically the test chip that we did. Some of you may have seen this picture already. We taped this thing out in April of this year. It was among one of the first shuttles that uh, were done. It's in the 20 uh, SOC process um, from TSMC. And the uh, main goals were, number one, of course, a uh, cat flow pipe cleaner. If you don't have a cat flow, forget about doing design, right, obviously. And then we just put a couple of fundamental uh, structures onto that, uh, among them ring oscillators, analog IP, a lot of devices that we wanted to test, as well as also DDR4 IOs, because uh, we thought that that would be very interesting. Uh, to be able to analyze. And of course, the main objective of all of this here is that you're able to really, number two, to figure out what are the effects of these things on analog design, which means what are the working analog design techniques and which ones don't work. And the other one, of course, is also to ensure that at some point you have very good correlation between your simulation environments and the actual silicon. Once you have that, we all tend to feel quite safe in what we do. Uh, maybe a little bit early on, I have to say, in 20. So what did we have there? Of course, we had to deal with double patterning for the first time. And uh, we put about 1,500 devices uh, on this thing, playing with different layouts, latency, uh, density dependencies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, both for the actual uh, the, uh, the, the MOS devices, the MOSFETs, as well as for the resistors and the capacitances. And the most important thing for us was able to, uh, to be able to analyze layout dependency, not just the behavior of the, the device per se, but being able to isolate the device on the test chip so that we could then start making statements about what happens when they start being in proximity of some other stuff. Obviously, the ring oscillators and the op amps, they gave us early insight into analog performance, gate delay, analog performance, very, very important, in particular also for embedded memories, right? And that's why ring oscillators are a key element of any test for embedded memories. And then, of course, also a, a keen interest in ESD uh, capabilities and uh, gaining some insight as to how to handle that. Last but not least, we talked about uh, reliability and aging, and it's all about stressing the devices so that we can kind of bring them to an end a little bit sooner, don't have to wait that long, and hopefully we'll be able to project and predict what's going to be happening over the lifetime of the devices. Okay, so um, what did we have on that? Basically, we put um, 
a bunch of uh, I to D, um, sorry, I um, current to voltage converter, converters, DAX, um, some current compare. We put some fast bis testing on that, and uh, by fast bis, it's a little bit an internal acronym. We have bis on all of our analog mix signal IP, and that's a way to allow us to do manufacturing tests of the analog signal IP on a digital tester. And of course, we're keen at being able to assess that that stuff is working. Right? Uh, otherwise, you may be designing in some testing structure onto your chip that's not working. And so that's the end, usually, of testing onto your new chip or your new IP. Uh, I already mentioned there were about 1,500 uh, different devices among transistors, resistors, capacitances, etc. And then all about playing with the densities and with uh, matching or actually with not matching of them. So if you look into this here, that's basically the, um, the test matrix there. And then a lot of it, as I was talking about, was already make sure that we start isolating the things that we're really interested in so that uh, these are controlled experiments. It's like in physics. The most important thing is that you understand your experimental environment, so your experiment, and you have, are able to execute it in a controlled fashion so that it becomes repeatable. Otherwise, what you have is a random collection of results. So on the... Um, on the uh, MOS device characteristics, we did the typical sweeps. Uh, we did it for NMOS as well as for PMOS devices. You can see the uh, width and length ratio of them. And then uh, run a bunch of transient, uh, did a lot of uh, transient uh, measurements. Uh, so test tip comes back. Uh, we start measuring all these things. And you can see that we're basically stepping uh, the uh, gate to source voltage from 0 0.3 to 0 0.9 volts. And then the drain to source is, being, uh, is the, the sweeping from 0 0.1 to, 9, to uh, 09. So sweeping down here, stepping to the color of the curves, and then you analyze that. And, uh, of course, you have to do this for pretty much all of the 1,000 uh, devices that you have on that chip. And after you do that and you analyze that, you're starting to get some sense as to what's happening with these core transistors and how do they behave under what circumstances, depending on what's going to be the density that you're going to have at that little spot of the chip later on. Density, by the way, is an extremely interesting topic when it comes to 90 nanometers, in particular when you're delivering IP that's going to be sitting somewhere and it's going to fill a little island among a bunch of other stuff that, of course, is also going to be impacting the density that exists on the IP that you just delivered. Um, and then, of course, we can start talking about what's the window that we want to bring over the whole thing. But that's, that's a very interesting topic, which leads me into density. So the foundry, of course, is going to be telling you what the, um, what the minimum diffusion density is and what the maximum diffusion density is. In this case, it was 26% for the minimum, 58% for the maximum. That's all great. The only problem is, after running our experiments, is that if we would stay within that range, then our devices don't match which means that if we have one device that's supposed to be matching because we're trying to do things symmetrically, that's sitting in the higher density area and the other one is sitting in a lo lower density area, you no longer have two matching devices. And that, uh, as we all know, has a significant number of problems. So while you're doing layout, you're now in the wonderful situation that you're already starting to do density checks all over and uh, are trying to uh, bring this and make it much more uniform and have now to make sure that when you're placing devices in that IP on the chip, those are in same density area, in particular for the really sensitive devices which are at the core of your design. And that's a significant complication. Um, just some war stories. Uh, you also know that we do embedded memories. Density fill for 28, you would just do it at the end. I mean, it was a task that would take a couple of days, and uh, uh, one of my guys was saying, nah, we don't even really have this in the plan. It's just part of the kind of last week. You just do it. You're done. Um, we're, doing, we're spending weeks doing density fills in 2022 uh, for something as regular as memories, where you would think, like, come on, what's the problem with that? That should be relatively easy. The amount of uh, compute power that we're burning right now in doing any sort of design in 20 is factor. So it's not a factor of two, it's a factor of three, four, five. In some cases, an order of magnitude higher than what we used to burn in uh, compute power for EDA tools. 
not just number of licenses, but also CPU cycles. It's becoming uh, fun. Of course, the engineers love it. Now, in order to be able to do something like this, and uh, the purpose of this, uh, of this test chip was to make sure that we would be able to accumulate real experience with that uh, semiconductor process very early on, at a point in time where also the founder wasn't able to tell us much about it. And we worked with TSMC very closely and the uh, OpenIP uh, program in order to be able to get that uh, chip manufactured, and a lot of the results were actually also shared with TSMC because in the end, we're just one little element that has to help the industry come to terms with designing in 20 so that the wheel keeps spinning, right? Semiconductor technology stops. I think our IP business stops relatively quickly too. Not very good. So let me show you a couple of things uh, in some more concrete examples. Let's look into data converters. Um, and this is a pretty old um, graph from the ITRS roadmap. What you can see is the threshold. You can see here the different node geometries, 90 nanometers coming down to 22. So when you start seeing these numbers, you may be able to figure out where this is coming from. Uh, 2002 all the way to 2018 estimated. You can see threshold voltage is coming down, right? Uh, that's this one here. This is not good for an analog design at least. While the VDD is also coming down, this is even worse news if you're an analog designer. And then uh, to make things a little bit more fun, actually you normally static power is just going higher. Uh, None of this is good. What you find yourself as an analog designer is that you have no more headroom in the transistors that you can use that are reasonably linear in order to do any form of meaningful design. Now, okay, now there's different type of, uh, of analog designs, but when you're coming to A to Ds and D to As, um, unfortunately, the dynamic range for audio or for image processing hasn't changed. It's remained the same. The system does not care about the problems that semiconductor technology brings with it. We have to figure out through design how can we tame the semiconductor technology progress, in quotes, in order to be able to still meet the system specifications. And this is just one example uh, that shows basically that it is possible to uh, achieve a consistent um, performance uh, specifications for um, A to D converters all the way down to using 1.8 volt thick oxides. Uh, this is something that's been taped out now a couple of times. You find it in LTE type of modems in uh, this type of process node. Uh, it was difficult, but it's doable. I think that's the, really the message here. Um, it is possible to do design with these 1.8 volt uh, oxides in the, um, the, um, the new core transistors. You can do it in 28, you can also do it in 20. Let me show you some examples that are coming from the 20 world. Um, this is a nice problem. That's DDR4 and LPDDR3. Again, everything just works against us. Uh, the system specification calls for higher performance, while at the same time it calls for lower power consumption. And uh, the devices that we have uh, at, uh, at our disposal are just getting worse. Now, um, a couple of things are interesting. Um, I mean, you look at these type of performance here, and you say, like, come on, I mean, 3.2 gigabit per second. We've done this a long time ago. This is kind of PCI Express Gen 1 speed range. And that's all true. There's just one issue is that those are differential pairs. Um, now what we have is we have single-ended interfaces of DDR4 and DDR3. Okay, well, so it's all about termination. Right, and we all know that, well, you start working on termination, and then you can come up with termination, and uh, then it's okay. Then you get rid of all the noise in there, and that's perfect. There's only one problem with that, which means termination consumes power. And if you look at what we want to do in things like here, at 2.1 gigabit per second, if we don't want to consume any power, the standard is called low-power DDR. So you have a number of contradicting um, requirements, which means just more of the same doesn't cut it. You have to constantly come up with new ways to approach this. Uh, one of the things that you have to do then in the end, because as you can see here, for instance, the actual frequency at which the core of the uh, DDR interface is running is not really changing. It's uh, somewhere here between 100 and 200 megahertz, and it's been there all the time. Right When the standards comes up, you go here, then you start progressing the standard, and you double the frequency, and that's basically it. And then uh, you start again. So you have to resort again to architectural tricks, and the architectural tricks in this case are larger prefetch sizes, bank interleaving, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I already talked about uh, the threshold voltage not scaling, the thick oxides being a disaster, and in the case of LPDDR3, 
we just throw in a variable reference voltage, just to make it a little bit more fun for the designers. It's doable. Uh, we have this working. Uh, probably Martin can also claim that he has something working in this space. Wouldn't surprise me. Um, again, the message is you have to take a step back. You have to understand all of the effects, which ones are important, which ones are not, and then come up with the right architectures. Taking what you had on the last generation and just fine-tuning it a little bit is not going to cut it. Um, USB 3, of course, uh, working for Synopsis is difficult to uh, leave the stage without talking about USB. So USB 3, this is actually the size of our 130 nanometer uh, USB 3 file. That's the first thing we did, not exactly. Um, and that was using 3.3 volt IOs. And then we thought, you know what, we can, I think we can do better. And for 65, actually, we looked at our USB 3. No, I mean, for the 65 nanometer type of market, that didn't cut it. And we were able to bring the area down. This is to scale. So this is the actual size on a 130 nanometer chip. That's the big square. And this is the actual size on a 65 nanometer chip. So what we were able to do is we were able to scale the area, which is what the digital designers or the SOC guys are kind of expecting. It's like, look, I mean, everything else is scaling. So your stuff also has got to get smaller. And by the way, don't consume more power while you do that. Um, we then tweaked a little bit more, and when, for our 1428 generation, we were able to get it to this point. And in the um, 20 nanometer chip that we put out, we were able to reduce it once more. So within a relatively short amount of time, we've been able to cut it down by about 30%. Now, this is, um, this is far from uh, where the digital scaled, between 130 and, um, and 20, obviously. But you can, by understanding standards better and better and better, despite all of the obstacles that get thrown into your way, you're able to come up with smaller analog design. It's a matter of know-how, and there's also a form of reuse. Uh, you reuse everything that you learned about something in order to move forward. Now, again, the um, system guys don't make it any easier for you. You still have to support all of the different speed grades, right, in the same layout. Um, Nobody is going to let, uh, let you off the hook on the ESD side and on the short side. Right, The 5 volts are still there. Uh, otherwise, things would be uh, maybe a little bit too easy. And it's doable. It's absolutely doable. Proof of the chips that we have. So in summary, um, I think the, uh, the thing that's changed fundamental, fundamentally is that the link between layout and circuit design uh, has gotten much, much stronger than it used to be. Uh, where you place things has become very important, um, in particular relative to other things you care about and other things you did not care about. They just happen to be there because everything is placed in some sort of context. The uh, quantization of the device sizes uh, means that uh, many of the approaches that you could use in 28 nanometers and even the attempt of reusing 28 nanometer layout, more or less, and work of that uh, no longer works. It's a ground-up development, at least it was in our case. Uh, double patterning and the effect on circuit density on the different metal stacks conditions must be considered. Uh, we are trying to, to the extent possible, work with foundries and customers to see if we can achieve at least a little bit of commonality in terms of metal stacks. Um, if you want to design IP these days in a way that you can just uh, swap stuff around in the metal stack because, hey, you're willing to give up a little bit here and a little bit there, that approach doesn't work anymore. The metals are getting too thin. Okay? Um, and last but not least, uh, power performance and area, that's what this PPA thing stands for. These are system requirements. It doesn't matter how complicated it's getting, we are not be being let off the hook. Uh, the system guys don't care about problems in semiconductor technology. That's a problem for the other guys. That's a problem for the designers. And you just figure out how to make these things work. And the trick to that is, as I said, already architectural uh, uh, variations or architectural design. Uh, last but not least, close cooperation with the foundry is extremely important. Uh, 28 is starting to be understood. I think Martin made a comment on all the variations of, uh, of a theme that we're seeing, like for 28, for instance. Um, and if I look at 28, it may sound like an old hat, 
it's by no means stable. There's a tremendous amount of movement. There's a tremendous amount of variability that we still see in some areas. I'm not saying in all the fabs, but for some of the processes and process variants. And uh, the train has already moved to 20. I'm not sure whether 20 is going to be a long-lasting note. It's really going to be depending on what happens with FinFET technology or with technologies like FDSOI. Do the ramp up uh, very quickly? If the ramp up very quickly, the days for a 20 planner may be more counted than if not. The sense that, uh, that exists today is that 16 FinFET or 14 FinFET or whatever you want to call it is around the corner. Uh, we will see. If it happens not to be, 20 may actually be uh, there for a little bit longer. We will see. It's kind of the answer. The answer is not clear to this year. Uh, where we are right now is we have taped out about uh, 10 test chips in uh, 20 nanometer planner technology. And we have customers who are going to start uh, going into production uh, relatively soon. Uh, whether this is going to become a uh, large market for IP is not known. But I think the IP business is also changing. Martin was talking about this, actually. He made some pretty interesting comments. Reuse in the form that we used to know it, like you take the same stuff and just put it on 20 chips, um, is no longer happening. I would even say it never happened. Um, our IP is highly configurable. I doubt uh, that two customers taped out the same configuration. In fact, sometimes I have my doubts whether one customer taped out the same configuration twice. Uh, because even if it's called a derivative and it's called, a, I'm just reusing the IP that I already bought, which means it's cheaper, right? Or less expensive, uh, Philippe. Uh, less expensive, I'm not going to say cheaper. Less expensive, uh, it's still not the same, right? Uh, so now the question is a little bit how do we go about the customization and how can we achieve that still in a way that it does not become suddenly cost prohibitive or that the only thing that we're doing is just selling bodies, right? Uh, which obviously would be a completely different kind of business. So having said that, I would like to say thank you very much.